Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, sexual harassment is now illegal under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Plus, an interview with a Marine Lieutenant Colonel who was booted from the service after publicly criticizing the United States pullout from Afghanistan. And later in the show, meet Military Times' new columnist serving military families. With the latest news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Daniel Wolfolk. President Joe Biden recently signed an executive action making sexual harassment a crime under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Following the story is Military Times Pentagon Bureau Chief Megan Myers. Megan, welcome back to the show. President Biden made an executive order that makes sex sexual harassment illegal in the military. Tell us about what, what the military is going to see. So what this executive action does is it takes sexual harassment from more of an administrative issue in the military to a criminal issue. So whereas before you might have commanders do their own investigation and maybe hand out some sort of administrative non-judicial punishment, now these cases can be investigated as crimes by a services criminal investigative command. Um, they can go to trial. And the biggest thing is that they can result in a dishonorable discharge and or prison time, um, which makes it uh, a much stronger offense than it used to be. And it's basically putting sexual harassment in the same category as sexual assault, where it's a crime and somebody else investigates it. It's two different. Right. It would be investigated as a crime would be investigated and there would be punishments uh, commensurate with that. Why did this take an executive action? Why isn't it a piece of legislation? So the executive action is actually a reaction to legislation. These changes, um, making sexual harassment a crime, along with a handful of things about how domestic violence is handled um, and other UCMJ updates, are part of the most recent National Defense Authorization Act. And so as part of the implementation, um, President Biden issued an executive order that then made those ads into the UCMJ. Sexual ass assault has been a crime. Now it's sexual harassment. Why did they make that distinction? Why did they make put sexual harassment in the same camp as sexual assault? So it depends on what you mean by putting it in the same camp. They're not in the same, you know, UCMJ article. Assault, sexual assault is under the assault section and sexual harassment is under um, Article 134, which is the general article. It's kind of a catch-all. It has been used, you know, in cases uh, to, to show why sexual harassment isn't okay. But now at this point, it's there's a separate specification in that article um, that makes it illegal. So, you know, the reason why harassment wasn't always considered a crime is that, you know, there's the harassment is a purely psychological, right, verbal issue versus something physical or something involving, you know, money, equipment, damage. Those are most of the things that are illegal under the UCMJ. But it's become very clear that sexual harassment is, you know, just as in, can be just as insidious um, and just as damaging to someone's, uh, you know, someone's career to good order and discipline as assault. So it stands to reason they would make it a crime as well. And we saw that with Vanessa Guillen. I think her she was murdered in April of 2020. That stemmed from a sexual harassment complaint. How is this going to change the way soldiers and any service member reports sexual harassment to authorities? So the in essentially the the reporting would be the same. It would just kind of be what happens after that. Um, rather than, you know, having a command investigation, it would be sent to um, criminal investigators. It could trigger um, it could trigger based on, you know, whether this whether the victim, whether the survivor is interested, it can trigger services. You can get a victim advocate. Um, who can help you out through the process. You could get a sexual, you know, you could get a response coordinator of some point of some part to help coordinate if you want to access mental health services. 
that sort of thing. So there are there's more there's more resources for for victims when it's a crime like this. And Megan, these changes don't necessarily take all of this outside of the command as some have wanted. Uh, how is this being handled? So within the NDAA, there is a provision uh, to stand up an office of special special counsel, basically, that would do sexual assault, would do domestic violence, and could now do sexual harassment, where those certain cases, rather than um, rather than a commander making the decision about charges or about sending something to trial, it would be um, an independent body of uh, of specialists who would make those decisions. So that has that won't be the case now, and it won't be the case for a while. Um, the Pentagon is sort of working through uh, the process to set up this independent council. Um, by the spring, they should have more of a framework for how they're going to do that. Um, but for now, it will still be um, adjudicated in the chain of command. All right, Megan, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. You can follow Megan's coverage on militarytimes.com. After the break, an interview with a former Marine officer who was kicked out of the service after calling for accountability for the Afghanistan pullout on social media. Welcome back, I'm Daniel Wolfolk. After the United States hasty withdrawal from Afghanistan in August, then Marine Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Scheller made a viral video in uniform calling for accountability for actions taken at the end of the conflict. A veteran of that Afghanistan war, Scheller was jailed and ultimately received a general discharge under honorable conditions. Scheller recently spoke to Marine Corps Times reporter James Webb about his views and what he's done since leaving the service. In August 2021, you made your first video, um, which started the rest of this, well documented. Was there a, a spark that led to you making that first video? No, I went into that day not expecting to make a video. Like, that wasn't pre-planned. Um, but the events leading up to it is just my experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan. Everything I'm talking about were ideas that I had been developing through reading and writing. Um, I studied in command of staff, foreign diplomacy, and how I thought we could make it more effective. And then when Afghanistan started happening, I just, I couldn't wrap my brain around it. I mean, we decided to do a withdrawal from April to September, which is literally the the peak fighting season, right? I mean, just that alone, like the, the, the start of the strategy, it was like, why are we not doing it from September to March? Like, that would make more sense. Um so then I, I, I was bothered, and then I was watching w when we abandoned Bagram Air Base. Like, I've spent time on Bagram Air Base. It's hard for people to fathom how critical that piece of key terrain was. Even when Trump made the conditional plan, if you look at it, the last thing that we left was Bagram Air Base for all the right reasons because of how critical that piece of terrain was. And then we just evacuated Bagram. We just let the Taliban walk in unopposed. We left like prisoners in the jail, weapons. Like I, we didn't tell our Afghan partners. I mean, it just blew my mind. So I'm, I'm getting angrier by the day. And then the commandant in response to that released a message saying, you know, if your sacrifices were worth it, yes, they were. But if you're struggling, go seek counseling. And that really bothered me because he was, I felt victimizing the service member. We have a, a real suicide problem. And they don't need to be just told, like, hey, if they're struggling, they have problems and they need to go seek a therapist. He needed to address the root cause of why they were upset, which is senior leaders failing to win wars because of poor strategy and poor operational design. In terms of your chain of command, did anyone at any point in time reach out to you and try to counsel you offline, you know, kind of see what's going on? Uh, have you spent time in the Marine Corps any number of times? my NCOs or officers, if there is a problem inside the platoon or the company, you know, they make a make it a point to pull people aside and try and talk to them offline. Uh, did you have anything like that occur? I did have one friend that did that, and then he shared the text to the investigating officer to show that he was trying to figure out my motive. So, you know, I it just felt like everyone that was trying to reach out to me was trying to hurt me. And so it was a very challenging situation. You know, I did what I believed in and we'll let the chips fall, but I'm, I'm trying to move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I think that the American military is still one of the strongest militaries in the world. There just are some fundamental issues that are not being addressed. I mean, our current Secretary of Defense is saying that the number one problem is COVID. 
He's also talked a lot about extremism, but he's not talking about procurement. He's not talking about education. He's not talking about winning wars, holding generals accountable, the things that a secretary of defense should be discussing. And so, you know, everyone has pointed out that it's not my place to say all these things, but my counter question would be, well, who else is saying it? To circle back to the the issue of accountability and the way that you exited the Marine Corps, it's kind of a two-part question here. Do you see, did you see any avenue inside the Marine Corps that would have allowed you to bring up these issues without getting in, you know, without stirring the pot the way you did? Um, and do you have a, any kind of message to, you know, people inside the Marine Corps today or the military today writ large who might be sharing the same kind of thoughts and, you know, looking for a way to push their concerns up the chain of command? Do you think there's a way inside to do that or does it have to be on the outside? I would never recommend somebody do what I did, but I will say that you need to identify your values prior to conflict. And when there's something that you truly believe in, that's part of your values, you need to really analyze your situation and figure out if it's worth fighting for. And that's what I feel like I did. I don't think that had I worked within the system, I mean, this is, this isn't something that I, I mean, I thought about this beforehand. Mm -hmm. Does going through the system via IG complaint, request mass, all of these processes, would that be effective? And I came to the conclusion that it wouldn't be based on my experiences of watching these processes before. And so, you know, everyone wants to talk about these processes, but they don't address how they're broken. That's why Congress right now is taking sexual assault out of the military's hands because our system, our military justice system is skewed. Anything else you'd like to add? Before we uh, we cut this or sign yeah, off. Yeah. So in closing, I'll just add. You know, a lot of people have told me that what I did won't make change, and that this is just the way it is, and that I should just accept this. And I fundamentally, philosophically disagree. I think the time right now is for people to find a voice and make change. I think we can't all be wrong. We all see the problems pretty clearly. And our senior leaders have demonstrated through action that they're not willing to address them. And so I think I can make change. I think people that think like me are getting louder, and I'm excited to see what the future holds. All right, Stu, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, James. You can watch the extended version of the interview on Military Times YouTube. And now for Defense Dollars. The Philippines will buy shore-based, medium-range, supersonic anti-ship missiles from an Indian company. The sale enhances the United States allies' ability to target adversarial ships from land. The Philippine National Defense Secretary and the head of BrahMos Aerospace signed the $368 million deal on January 28th. It'll provide the Pacific country with three batteries of BrahMos anti-ship missiles. Oshkosh Defense recently unveiled a silent driver hybrid version of the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle the company has fielded the EJLTV for the United States military and other customers. Oshkosh President John Bryant said it is an affordable way to provide electric light tactical wheeled vehicles to the fleet without sacrificing performance. He added that the vehicle would eliminate the noise and heat signatures associated with diesel engines. Oshkosh is focusing on a hybrid vehicle rather than a fully electric version because it says it eliminates the need for charging stations, which as you can imagine are hard to find on battlefields. And the Army plans to release a request for proposals early this year and award a contract to one team in September of 2022. Navistar, GM Defense, and AM General have all said they plan to compete. And around the world, North Korean state media released a report early Monday acknowledging the country's latest missile test, which was detected by its neighbors on Sunday. The Korean Central News Agency reported the missile was a Hwasong-12 type ground-to-ground -ground intermediate and long-range ballistic missile. The website of the Worker's Daily newspaper published images that it said showed the missile being launched from a mobile launcher. There were also two images of the Earth, which KCNA referred to as, quote, taken from space by a camera installed at the missile warhead. The authenticity of the claims or pictures could not be verified. It was North Korea's seventh missile test in January 22. And a quick note about the situation between Russia and Ukraine. It's a quickly developing story that can be tracked at both militarytimes.com and defensenews.com. Coming up after the break,
Personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives you tips on how to get started investing. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack shows us how much money we need to get started investing. If you're not investing for retirement or the future, ask yourself why not? A lot of people put off investing or even saving for an emergency because they think they don't have enough money. A recent Navy Federal survey found that 66% of military members and their families aim to build an emergency fund before investing. But not as many are actually doing it. It can start with as little as $5 a week. That's only 20 bucks a month. This money can help if you have a car issue, a health issue, or something unexpected comes up. The goal is to save at least three to six months of pay and reserve that for emergencies only. Once you surpass this goal, you can think about moving on to investing. You should already be doing this in your TSP or 401k. But if you're looking to give your nest egg a boost, you can open a brokerage account and sock away money for your future with as little as $25 every month, only $5 more than you were saving for your emergency fund. Over time, you'll see the effects of compounded returns as you accrue interest. To get started, talk to a financial advisor you feel comfortable with. And don't be afraid to talk savings and investments. Even the smallest savings habits can help you finish big. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll check back with you next week. In the meantime, if you want more in-depth military and defense coverage, check out our headlines at Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com. And while you're there, subscribe to our newsletters to get top stories in your inbox every weekday and give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And when we return, we will learn about Military Times new column, The Home Front. That's after the break, so stick around. Military Times has launched a new column for military families. I caught up with Kerry Irvin from The Home Front earlier this week. Military Times recently launched The Home Front from columnist Kerry Irvin, who is with us right now. Kerry, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Daniel. I'm really excited to be here with you today. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about The Home Front. So the home front is really exciting to me because it's a column that is focused in on the military family members. We know that our service members rightly have a lot of supports in places, uh, but we want to focus in on supporting those who support our service members. So the home front is going to be diving into uh, the, the challenges as well as the triumphs of military family life. And you're no stranger to military family life. Tell us about your background. I am absolutely no stranger to military family life. I am the daughter of an Army aviator, the wife of an Army aviator, and the mother of an Army infantryman. He kind of broke the mold there. Um, but yes, my whole life has been wrapped up in the military, and I absolutely love this lifestyle and love the community. And what kind of topics are you covering in the home front? So in the home front, we are really kind of wanting to tackle what's going on today. We know that trends change, needs change within the sphere of military family life. And what we're really looking to do is shine a spotlight on the challenges as well as the triumphs of military family life. We know that there's a lot of both. Um, and we'd really like to become a resource that military families can turn to to find some new updates, new tips, tools, and techniques, and new, new people to contact whenever they need some help or when they just want to share the good news of their lives. And your first column is already up. It has, some, it has to do with military family caretakers. Tell us a little bit about that topic. Absolutely. So this very first column, we definitely wanted to focus in on a hidden population of the military family, and that is the 2.3 million military connected children who actually perform caregiving duties in their own households. Uh, think about like wounded warrior homes or even gold star family homes where there's a fallen hero. These children step up to take on responsibility that's well beyond their years and many times. Um, and it leads to a lot of different challenges that they face, 
on top of being a military child. We know that there's all kinds of challenges with being a military child, but these are very unique challenges um, and a lot of uh, adversity at some points in time. So we really wanted to shine a light on what's going on in their lives, bring awareness to the fact that there are 2.3 million military children that are doing this and try to help bridge some support for them. Carrie, you mentioned 2.3 million children and military families in the United States. That is a large number. What kind of resources are out there for, for these families? You're right, Daniel. That is actually a really staggering figure when you think about it. Um, but there is hope on the horizon for these children and for their families through the White House's Joining Forces Initiative. Uh, we have this coalition called Hidden Helpers. That's government agencies partnering with nonprofit organizations across the nation to bring resources to these families to try to help bring awareness about this hidden, often overlooked population of military children, as well as trying to bridge together support and resources through schools, coaches, after school activities, um, civilian personnel who interact with these children on a daily basis. They're really, the Hidden Helpers Coalition is really trying to bridge a lot of support for these children. And earlier you alluded to the fact that this is not just your column, but it's a, it's a back and forth conversation with the readers. How can people get a hold of you? Absolutely. I want this to be a conversation, right? Uh, so at the home front, we do have um, the opportunity to to accept questions. I'd love to have questions come in from our readers. I'd love to hear about concerns, resources that are working for the readers to share with others as well. And I can be reached at homefront at militarytimes.com or on my Twitter, which is just carry on and it's K-E-R-R-Y. Well, Carrie, welcome to the Military Times family and welcome to Defense News Weekly. Thanks for being on here today. It's absolutely been my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. You can read the home front on militarytimes.com. And that's it for this week. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week.